Hello and welcome. I'm going to be talking tonight with William Cope Moyers about a new book he's written called Now What? Um, if you haven't heard about the book, we're going to be talking about addiction because William is a man who has gone through a lot of stuff and is a recovering addict. He is um, the Vice President for Community Relations and Public Affairs at Hazelden. He is, as many of you know, the son of William and Judith Moyers, and I'm delighted to have him here tonight. I just told him that this book helps me understand addiction in some ways that I didn't before. And I've read quite a bit about it, know quite a bit about it, but you unlock some, some mysteries for me. So looking forward to picking your brain. Well, thank you. If I say to you, William, October 1994, mm -hmm. what comes to mind? Well, that was my now what moment, Mary. That was the moment when I was relapsing with my chronic disease of addiction to alcohol and other drugs. I'd been abstinent for a number of years in the early 90s, but in uh, October of 94, I relapsed again, and uh, I found myself at that crossroads, that turning point, that moment that was now what? Now what am I gonna do? And it was in that moment, October the 12th of 94, that I realized for the first time that I couldn't answer that question of my, on my own. And I... Had you up until that point thought, I can yeah. figure this out by myself? Sure, I had first gone to treatment at Hazelden actually in 1989 at the age of 30. I've come out to Minnesota from New York and went to treatment in 89. I went to treatment a second time at Hazel in the 91, and then I remained abstinent, not recovering the way that I describe it in the book, but not using, mm -hmm. and sort of got on with my life, mm -hmm. thinking that my disease, my illness was behind me, mm -hmm. that it had been fixed, mm -hmm. and that I didn't really need to tend to it anymore, that it was just a part of my past, and I relapsed. Uh, addiction is an illness of uh, great patience, as well as being cunning, baffling, and powerful, and it got me. How did that relapse that last relapse happen because I, I think taking, people are curious about you know, you know knowing so much is at stake how does it happen well it, it creeps up on us um, mm -hmm. it, that, that doesn't absolve us of the responsibility to the contrary it's very important just like with any other chronic disease be it diabetes or hypertension or asthma mm -hmm. the person who has the illness has to learn how to manage it mm -hmm. because there is no cure for addiction at least not yet but there is a solution that solution is personal responsibility and recovery and I stopped being responsible in my recovery. I stopped doing the things that had been uh, prescribed to me over the years in terms of uh, remaining not just abstinent, but taking care of my mind, my body, my spirit. So it crept up on me, it got me, I relapsed. One day I just said, you know, I think I'll go out and try to use again or mm -hmm. use differently. And did you think, I think I can use a bit and still keep in control? Initially, um, I did. I thought I could use again and not repeat the mistakes of the mm -hmm. past, which had not always led me down. not get sucked down mm -hmm. and pulled to the bottom again. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, to be candid with you, I also was suffering um, a lot with sort of accepting life on life's terms. Uh, there were things going on in my life. It was fast paced. I was uh, having a family. I was working as a journalist at CNN in Atlanta in 1992, 93, 94. I was sort of too busy. Pressure cooker Pressure days. cooker, and, mm -hmm. and I was also sort of, um, you know, complacent in my recovery. Mm -hmm. And like I said, uh, I stopped sort of taking my medicine, if you will. I stopped mm -hmm. doing the things that were given to me. And it came to me, and it, I started using again, and bang, I went down right like that. And I had that now what moment, October 12th of 94, when I, I couldn't answer the question. And I said, you know, I'm done. And I've been clean and sober one day at a time since that morning of October 12th of 94. So how many years is that? I'm not good at math. 18-ish. Wow, 18-ish, that's 18 -ish. good. 18-ish. That's good. Yeah. Um, if a person goes 18 years, your book sounded like, I think I understood you right, that you have a better chance of continuing yes. on than you might have at eight years. That's right. I work at Hazel, and so we sort of see the continuum of the process mm -hmm. from the moment somebody walks into the front door under the influence and just totally ravaged by the illness to 10, 15, 25, 30 years later coming back for a tune-up or for uh, some of the programming that we offer in terms of helping people stay ensconced in recovery. And it isn't just Hazel, but a lot of us in the field know that the longer somebody can remain in recovery, the better their chances are to to stay that way, mm -hmm. uh, that the longer you can put between that last drink and 
the days that follow it, you'll be okay. But as I talk about in the book, uh, there's a chapter called uh, relapse is not a dirty word. And relapse is part of the process for a lot of people. It's not a desired outcome because with relapse come all kinds of consequences, including loss of life and other things. Mm -hmm. but, um, but relapse often, in my case, for example, was that teachable moment in which I said, yeah, you know, I better do it the way I'm told to do it and not the way I want to do it. Mm -hmm. And so as long as we remain teachable in the process, relapse can become an ally, even though it oftentimes comes with all kinds of consequences. That's a very important dis differentiation, though, mm -hmm. isn't it? Because if you are so shamed or so distraught about the relapse that you can't get the energy up to do something about it. Right, and that's the irony of this chronic illness versus other ones. And I try to, in my book now, what I, I try to deconstruct or, or burst the myth mm -hmm. around a lot of, of the perceptions, public perceptions and personal perceptions that people have around alcoholism or drug dependence. Mm -hmm. And what I try to deconstruct among others is that, um, you know, it is, a, it is a chronic illness, mm -hmm. and that relapse is, is possible. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was a part of a lot of chronic illnesses. Lo that's exactly right. I mean, mm -hmm. people relapse with diabetes or hypertension mm -hmm. or cancer. asthma, cancer all the time, and yet you don't get that shame right. component right. that you get with alcoholism or drug mm -hmm. dependence. And there are a lot of reasons for that. We could talk about that for an hour. But, the, but what I try to do in the book is to let people and their families know that it's okay to ask for help. Sometimes it's okay to ask for help more than once. And you might have to. Yes, indeed. You, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because there's so many questions I have, but the health risks for mm -hmm. addicts, I had not heard it stated quite so clearly as you did. Tell us the health risks in terms of cancer and heart disease when you're um, alcoholic. Well, the, the incidences of, Alcoholism, alcohol, and other drugs. And they, other drugs, and yes. They, they, they weaken the body. They weaken the mind, the body, and the spirit. And, f and from that weakened state, all kinds of things can happen. And so people who are under the influence of mood and mind altering substances are oftentimes more susceptible to accidents, um, other chronic illnesses, uh, mental illness, uh, you know, financial consequences, familial consequences. I mean, somebody under the influence is sort of fully exposed to all that life is going to throw at them. And so what I try to do in the book is to let people know that addiction is a disease. It does not discriminate. It doesn't matter what kind of family you come from. Mm -hmm. And I grew up lacking for nothing. Uh, I came from a well-to-do family and a, a family. Educated of, family. Educated family. Mm -hmm. But what I try to do is to tell people that it's, addiction is, is a disease. It doesn't discriminate. Treatment works. Recovery is possible. And that falling down and getting back up is sometimes the most important thing that somebody who's struggling can do. When you mentioned family, mm -hmm. I was very struck reading the book. Um, and by the way, he's also written a memoir called Broken, which became a bestseller. Yes. I haven't read it. I've got to read it. But um, this book, as I read through it, I thought you really tie in to the effect of one's addiction on the whole family. Right. It's not just the disease of one person, is it? No, in fact, my parents, Judith and Bill Moyers, they wrote the foreword to this book. Can I just quote sure. something your dad wrote? Because it was oh. so powerful. He said, in talking about your addiction, when a giant hole opened in our lives, and he, meaning you, William, tumbled head first toward the bottom, we were sucked down with him. And in the darkness, ignorance almost devoured me. Mm -hmm. That is very powerful. Well, you think uh, about it. In I terms mean, of the meaning. Absolutely. I think one reason why I wanted my parents to write the forward, well, there were two main reasons. One is that they're my parents and they've been through that experience. And secondly, they're both educated. My father is, you know, the journalist Bill Moyers. He's <laughs> won 60 Emmys and a couple of Pulitzer Prizes, and he's done all that stuff. But even he fell into the dark right. abyss of ignorance and that he comes. thought for a while he could somehow save you. That's exactly right. And he isn't was his, that what all parents want well, to that's do, That's what they right? want to do. Sure. And who wouldn't? Sure. Who wouldn't if, you know, you have a child or you have a spouse or you have a sibling? We have a coworker mm -hmm. who's struggling. You want to save them, mm -hmm. and uh, there is a role that all of those people can play in 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 helping to slow the addict's plunge into the abyss. But at the end of the day, whether it's Bill and Judith Moyers or you or anybody else, 
there's only so much you can do. It's up to the addict and the alcoholic, me, to take that responsibility. You talked about tying into what you're saying, three C's for the family. And it's just a nice right. way to remember this, but I didn't cause it as a mother or father. I can't control it, the, right. the addiction, and I can't cure it. And that's, that's right. a, a pretty important thing for people to realize, isn't it? It is. I wish I could take credit for that. But as I've learned in this long journey of recovery that I've been on, and now for the last 15 years working at Hazelden, there's not very much original thought in those processes. All of these things come from those before sure. us. So somebody sure. else coined that phrase, but it's true for the parent or the coworker mm -hmm. or the spouse. Mm -hmm. You didn't cause it. You can't control it. You can't cure it. That's also true in a way for the addict and the alcoholic themselves. Mm -hmm. I didn't cause my addiction. Mm -hmm. um, I really can't control it uh, and I can't cure it. But That's what true. I can do is take responsibility. I can be part of the solution, not the problem. And I can manage my, um, my recovery over a long period of time. When you say I didn't cause it, one of my best friends is a man who um, is a recovering alcoholic, mm -hmm. and he said the first time he had a drink, it was magical. He felt this is the most wonderful the answer. feeling. Yeah. And, you know, I said, well, gosh, first time I had a drink, I thought, oh, <laughs> what's the big deal here? But it is true, isn't it, that for an, a person who becomes an addict, that first taste of whatever it is, is very different than for someone who is right. not going to become addicted. Usually that's true, and I talk about that in the book. Uh, you know, m most people who can drink responsibly and even those who can use illegal drugs responsibly, I know that sounds like an oxymoron, but the fact of the matter is there are a lot of people who use illegal drugs and don't develop an addiction mm -hmm. problem like I did. They don't usually remember that first time, but mm -hmm. that's what right. separates us as addicts mm -hmm. and alcoholics from 90% of the rest of the population. We, almost always clearly remember it. Um, you remember and, who you were with, where you were. And the feeling, mm -hmm. and the and feeling. The I feeling. mean, I, I wrote about it not so much in Now What, but in my book, uh, my memoir, Broken, which came out in 2006. I clearly remember the first time I smoked marijuana. It, 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 it was the answer. Mm -hmm. And it filled what I talk mm -hmm. about in the book as the hole in the soul. Um, yeah, that is a, a, such an interesting thing for me to think about. Um, and in terms of defining who an addict is, that gets, that gets tricky too, doesn't it? It does. I mean, how do you put it in a sentence or in a short paragraph? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, you know, I'm not a medical doctor. I work with a lot of psychologists and psychiatrists and medical doctors who can define addiction, bang, like mm -hmm. that. What I oftentimes, to the layman, because that's what I am, um, I explain to people that addiction, an addict and an alcoholic is somebody who cannot control or regulate or stop the use of substances despite repeated consequences over and over again. You know, they, de they, they define that as insanity, is the, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Well, that's what addicts and alcoholics do. The physiology of the illness, I talk about a little bit in there. I try to, mm -hmm. I, I quote the American Society of Addiction Medicine new definition of uh, addiction as a brain disease, and it's quite rambling and confusing, and I think that's kind of the point. Mm -hmm. It is a disease that has its mm -hmm. origins in the brain. There's no mm -hmm. doubt about it. Uh, science is explaining addiction in ways that we never could have explained before. But there's more to it than that. Uh, it's much more complex, and what I try to do in Now What is demystify what the illness is, but also to move people from that problem to a practical solution, mm -hmm. because there is a solution, and nobody should suffer with this illness if, you know, there are, there, are, there are options out of it. What you're seeing, the part that jumps out at me just now, William, is the lack of control over right. the substance, the because I think a lot of people maybe misuse a drug, right. but but don't maybe do it in a way that they can't stop misusing it. Or Mary, they learn from the mistakes. Let's say somebody goes to a Vikings game 
and they have a great time at the game and they drink a little bit too much mm -hmm. and they get in the car and they go home and they get stopped for a DWI. Mm -hmm. And they say, you know what, I'm not going to do that next time. And they mm -hmm. learn from that. Mm -hmm. But uh, addicts and alcoholics suffer all kinds of consequences. And even though they have those consequences, not always do they learn from that experience, so they keep doing it over and over again. That's why you read in the paper the multiple DWIs, right, right. the homelessness, the crime. So with the whole disease comes a lot of rationalization, doesn't it? Yeah, we're all twisted upside down when we're under the influence, and we, mm -hmm. we an addict and an alcoholic will insist that the sky is cloudy when it's blue, <laughs> and an addict and an alcoholic will insist that they're in control of things when everybody else knows they're not. It is a disease of denial, and it does twist the perspective, the mind, the thinking of the addict and the alcoholic so that you can tell them that everything is up and they'll say, no, it's down, or vice versa. It's a perplexing dynamic of the illness that you don't get with a lot of other illnesses. Mm -hmm. That's why it is a disease of the brain, but it also is a disease of the spirit. And it's also mm -hmm. one that has behavioral components right. that are unlike it's, it anything else. It crosses a lot of And no um, wonder there's stigma lines, around it. it. And that's sure. it, it, one reason why I wrote this book is because I've been very public as a recovering al addict and alcoholic. 18 years, I've worked at Hazel 15 or 16 years now. I've been a lightning rod. Uh, a, a lighthouse, a beacon of hope, a lint brush. Whenever I go into a community, <laughs> sort of roll in there, I pick up all the addicts and alcoholics. People turn to me for help all the time because okay. they know I'm accessible, I'm a recovering alcoholic, and I work for a good place, Hazelin. Is and that in some ways, though, Bill, or William, sorry, uh, a burden? Not really. I mean, it's what I do. It's my mm -hmm. responsibility. It's part of the reason why I have the job I have at Hazelin, mm -hmm. is to carry the message, mm -hmm. is to um, help educate the public and help people get help, whether they end up going to Hazelin or any other of the number of good programs that I refer people to. It's not a burden, it's a responsibility. And I'm very grateful, Mary, that you know here I am. Who would have thunk it? Mm. There was a time when I was locked up in a crack house in New York City in 1989, in St. Paul in 1991, in, in Atlanta in 1994, when I had my now what moment. Who would have ever imagined? All these Did years later, I would be helping people. Did you know how bad it was, how bleak it was, or were you still no. at that point kind of in a, a haze, in a sense, in denial? Well, I was in denial. There's no doubt about it, but I was feeling it. And I don't think any act of an alcoholic doesn't know what's going on. They may deny it. They may mm -hmm. not want to believe it. They may try to mitigate it. But at the end, when we know the gig is up, when it's getting near the bottom, we know what's going on. You said, I believe I've remembering right, um, because I've read this in, in different um, periods the last few weeks, but I, I understood you to say you don't necessarily think someone has to get to the bottom no. though, before they take action. There's and only one that bottom. was interesting to me because I've no. often heard the opposite or right. the other side that, well, wait till he hits bottom, then he'll, you know, be then ready. he'll be willing right. to do something. Right. I, I, I try to deconstruct that myth too, and here's why. Because we know at Hazelin that there's only one bottom with this illness. It's death. Mm -hmm. so the elevator's why, going down, so right? So why wait for it? Mm -hmm. So I say to the loved one or, uh, or, or to the family member, the employer, I say, look, if you've got an addict and alcoholic in your life, don't wait for them to hit bottom because they'll be too late then. Anything less than that is a way out. Now, that doesn't mean that they, that you know, you uh, can pluck them from the abyss before they get into the abyss. You can't. Mm -hmm. They got to get down there. Mm -hmm. But if you wait until they're ready, sometimes it's too late. And so, so as I say, do take, take action. action. And so what is that try. action? You know, you mm -hmm. start talking to the act and the alcoholic in your life and you say, you know, Mary, I'm worried about you. I love you. I think you've got a problem. Well, what do you mean, Mary might say. And you might say, well, you know, I think you drink too much. Well, no, I don't. But the point of it is the addict and the alcoholic may not be ready at that point, but if you begin to, to confront them with the truth, ultimately it begins to sink in and start to turn their ship or so slow them down. So even if they're acting like they don't yeah. like what you're saying, say it. keep saying it. Say it. And, yeah, say it. And because always, it's registering somewhere. It's planting seeds. Mm -hmm. You know, you hope it is. I think a lot of... I've heard people say, quite a few people, I, I didn't want to lose my friendship. I felt if I pushed the person, yeah. he or she would reject me, and then I wouldn't have any chance to 
be an influence. You're going to lose the inf you're going to lose the friendship anyway. You're going to lose well, the relationship if the anyway. Dies, yeah. If the person dies or gets mm -hmm. locked up in prison or so on. Mm -hmm. So so anyway, the I I use the book as a way to sort of deconstruct these myths, some of the things that you've raised with me today. And because I am so public, I get thousands and thousands of letters. In fact, being on your program, I promise you this. Being on your program, there'll be somebody who watches it who says, "Oh, there's, a, there's an addict and alcoholic, I'll contact him, and somebody will get help out of this. There's this very poignant letter in the book that, that says, right. Dear Mr. Moyers, right. help me, my son is dying. Mm -hmm. I've never met that woman, Marcy, from Zanesville, Ohio. She wrote me in 2010, I get letters like that all the time. But I, I started thinking, you know, I gotta write a book that helps people like Marcy who, who don't know what to do with, in this case, with her son, Scott. Yeah, that, that letter did, did jump out at me. Um, do you think that people who have gotten a long way down into the, the abyss need to do a, a month-long in-house treatment, ideally? Well, in a perfect world, everybody would get what they need. But the reality is, is that addiction, just like health care, is something that people can afford and some that mm -hmm. can't afford. Uh, at Hazelden, you know, we are specialists when it comes to residential treatment. So people can come to Hazelden for 25, 30, 35 or longer days if they can afford it or if their insurance will pay. But we also recognize the reality that the field of addictions treatment is changing. And um, we're changing with those times. We're an innovator and a pioneer in a lot of ways. And we see the, the importance of outpatient treatment. And outpatient treatment can be just as effective. Can it? Do, Absolutely. Do, statistically, do people do as well? They do, and I don't know those numbers specifically, mm -hmm. but if we didn't believe it was true, we wouldn't have outpatient mm -hmm. treatment. And we offer outpatient treatment um, in all the states that we operate in, approximately. Um, and a lot of people can access treatment that way. It's a, it's a practical way for people to begin to, to change and to get well. Um, I know that you've got a weekly column. Right. And is that, can you tell us how to access that? Because sure. that would be another way for people to reach you besides yeah. calling you up. Or they can email call me you. at Hazelden. They can, um, you know, the website, www.hazelden.org, is a real easy way to find me. I'm listed in the phone book in St. Paul. But mm -hmm. I write a syndicated column that's syndicated out of Los Angeles every week that's called Beyond Addiction. And, you know, in this day and age of the internet, you could just put in William Moyers Hazelden and you, I can get found. We can all get found. And that's a good thing when it comes to this yes, illness. Yes, with this illness for sure. Absolutely. Um, do you think that if the addict ideally is, is going through treatment, mm -hmm. the family needs to also be part of it? No doubt about okay. it. That's why we have such no a good family doubt. program at that's Hazelden. That's a strong reaction. And not go mm -hmm. one step further, Mary. The fact of the matter is this. A lot of people never get to treatment. A lot of the addicts and alcoholics that I work with, or their families, they never make it. They die, or they go to prison, or they're just not ready. Mm -hmm. But I, I always tell the families that no matter what happens to the addict and the alcoholic in your family, you as a family member must get well. Mm -hmm. And so go to Al-Anon, or get therapy, or go so to a family saying, program. So William, that if, the, if you're married to an addict, or you are the son or daughter of an addict, you are also affected. Impacted. Are you also sick? Are you well, also, you're sick. are you going that far? I, yeah, you know, I think sick is a term that people can loosely or stringently apply to any right. sort of condition. Are you under the influence of the acting alcoholic? Yes, mm -hmm. and you should get well because guess mm -hmm. what? Sometimes the acting alcoholic isn't a, isn't around any, anymore to get well. You've been ravaged by it five, 10, 20, 30 years mm -hmm. ago and you're still mm -hmm. suffering from it. The scars of it are pretty mm -hmm. deep. So I always tell people, Every day, really every day, I say, go to the family program at Hazelden, or go and get therapy, or go to an Al-Anon meeting mm -hmm. for, you know, and, and, and get well. And they say, well, why? And I say, because you, you've been just as affected as the addict and the alcoholic. And I'm not kidding you. It's like turning on a light switch in their brains. They go, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, mm -hmm. really? Just the other day, a woman Facebooked me. That's another modality of finding me. I'm right. easy to find on Facebook. <laughs> this woman Facebooked me the other day, and her, her um, husband was killed in Vietnam. Now, that was... 40 years ago, right. and he was an active opium addict at the time. She has suffered with that ever since. I said to her, you know, why don't you go and get some help for yourself? And she goes, well, why? I said, because you were married to him. You loved him, and he died. So 
so everybody that's in the nuclear family really needs to get some attention for it. Yes, that's whether the, the person is alive or not. That's exactly right. Uh -huh. uh, that's and important for people to hear. So important because you know when when an addict and alcoholic begins to get well, that changes the dynamic of the family as well. Yes, I once heard that a family is like a mobile. You right. shift one piece of the mobile, everything else yeah, tilts on its axis. Shakes. That's right. Mm -hmm. And so when the addict and the alcoholic is going through the recovery, pro the treatment and the recovery process, so the family must go through the treatment and recovery process as well. Not in the, the intense way that the addict and the alcoholic does necessarily, mm -hmm. but in a way that allows for change. I would think most family members would find that a positive, but I, I know of some that are almost hoping that the addict yeah. doesn't change because then their whole life is is up, upset in a way. Well, there is a dynamic in a family that'll, that um, that some people don't want to see change. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, uh, there are a lot of family members and the nuclear family, as you talked about it, that doesn't think the problem has anything to do with them. And right. while it might be the act of the alcoholic's right. problem, the fact of the matter is the problem is spilled over into the family mm -hmm. dynamic More to the point that everybody realize. needs to get well. And this book helps people to not only get the addict and the alcoholic on the road of recovery, but to get themselves on that same road of recovery, even if it's a going down a different path or, or on a different timeline. I have to stop and, and let you know, thank you so much for oh, coming down. I want to give you, the viewers, just a quick a repeat of your website, www.hazelden.org. It's been great having you on, and um, thank you so much for your, your uh, enthusiasm for this whole topic and for the hope that you present personally and, and professionally. And, and um, as I said, I, I love the book and found it so practical. So the name of the book, folks, Now What? So thank you. Yeah, Very much, William Moyers. Thank you, Mary. Mm -hmm.